about cases. So, you know, the beginning is when do you suspect encephalitis? And encephalitis essentially is an inflammation of the brain. And how I think about encephalitis is I use my basic clinical skills to kind of think about, well, what's the pretest probability that somebody will have encephalitis? So based on the exam, you know, fevers, um, if they have serous criteria, so, you know, hypo, hypotensive, um, tachypnic, tachycardic, those kind of clue me into, could this be some sort of inflammatory condition? Um, when you look at their basic blood work, what high white blood cell count, lactate, ESR, CRP, things that whenever you see on anybody's lab, you think about infection, which is one that other causes of encephalitis. Then, you know, if my concern is high enough, then I do a little more invasive or more dedicated neuro testing, so like CSF studies, and you may see elevated white blood cell count, proteins, and oligoclonal bands. And then you may do the imaging, uh, which is non invasive. So I almost always do imaging, uh, which is MRI of the brain specifically, looking for patterns of enhancement or flare change it, which could clue me into a specific type of encephalitis. And an EEG can also be helpful as well, because when your brain is inflamed, it's irritated, it's going to have discharges, it's going to be abnormal. It clues me in that, hey, this is not something that's functional, something that actually is going, something's going on in the brain that we can't see, and we need to investigate further. Um, so causes of encephalitis, like I kind of alluded to, my talk will be focused on autoimmune and infectious encephalitis. But we have to kind of keep in mind that other things can cause encephalitis, drugs, medications, epilepsy, neoplasm, and vascular conditions. So specifically about infectious and autoimmune, how do you kind of differentiate the two? And there's different things that you use, timing, age, risk factors, and, and et cetera. So when you look at just the timing, somebody with an infectious encephalitis, you usually have hours to days of neurologic symptoms versus autoimmune, more days to weeks, so longer. Their age, we think of infections being more common in the kind of the um, outlier range group of newborns and, and the elderly, while autoimmune conditions you tend to see in that, that young 20s to 30 age group. Risk factors, depending on where you live, uh, where you travel, that can clue us into po possible infectious um, causes. And then autoimmune, if you have a history of autoimmune disease, if you have one, you can easily get another one. Um, similar between the two, if you're immunocompromised, you have a high risk of getting an infectious and or an autoimmune condition. Looking at the clinical presentation, like I kind of talked about the SIRS criteria, that clues me into something's, something's brewing, some kind of infection is brewing in, in, in the patient. Versus autoimmune, they usually have behavioral changes and like abnormal movements or dyskinesias, which I don't often see. I don't always see with an infectious cause. Their basic blood work, you know, think about the basic infectious blood work that you get for anybody, um, high lactate, high white blood cell count, et cetera, et cetera. Versus somebody who's autoimmune, I think of like rheumatologic labs being abnormal, ANA, ENA, rheumatoid factor, et cetera, et cetera. Looking at the spinal fluid, neutrophils, uh, are the common type in infectious versus in autoimmune um, and infectious, you can see more of a lymphocytic predominance. So if, really, if you see neutrophils, it's very rarely gonna be an autoimmune cause. And then no really major distinguishing factors for MRIs because they both can have contrast enhancement and they both can have flare changes. And similar with the EEG, it's not really necessarily distinguishing between the two infectious and autoimmune. I use MRI and EEG to support whether somebody has an encephalitis. Um, so the workup and treatment for suspected encephalitis, you know, you, once again, you get that basic 
blood work, spinal fluid testing, brain MRI typically. And then I always start the patients on um, antimicrobials because I have to always think about an infectious cause first. So usually they're on empiric, vinc, cetraxone, and cyclovir, plus minus ampicillin, depending on their age. Um, as we do the workup, as things kind of come back, I may wean the antibiotics because it's not looking like an infection or a bacteria and maybe to be more viral or everything's negative. So I wean up all these medic, all these antimicrobials. And then if there's a suspicion high enough for an autoimmune cause, that's when I think about these immune suppressant medications, steroids, IVIG, severe cases, Plex, and even just other more, we'll say, um, rarer um, immune medications. So once again, why do I treat an infection before autoimmune? It really goes back to this, this principle that kind of governs a lot of immunology is that you treat infections with antivirals, antibiotics, and you treat autoimmune cephalitis with immune suppression medications. So if you suppress the immune system and there's a rampant infection, your body's not going to be able to fight off the infection. That infection is going to spread. So we always treat the infection before we suppress the immune system, if there's any concern at all. So I just want to do this like quick kind of, you know, what's like, we'll call a thought game where I want you guys to look at these eight MRIs of eight different patients. These are all just contrast enhancing um, imaging. And I want you to just kind of look, just can you just by looking at an MRI, not knowing the history, we'll say that the history is just somebody who is encephalopathic. Um, if you can diagnose what these, these different patients have just by just an MRI. The answer should obviously be no. Um, and the reason being because what I'm trying to get at is an infection and demyelinating and a neoplastic disease can all look like each other. So here are the kind of these cases. It's a tuberculoma, one's, one is a, a MET, the third one's an abscess, you see cystocercosis, which is an infection, nocardia, which is a fungal infection, aspergilloma, a fungal infection, toxo, which is also an, uh, a, what was, we'll call it an opportunistic infection, and then a demyelinating disease is this last one. And we can kind of do it again right now. So this is more of a, more of a flare. So this is just T2 flare changes. Look at these eight different cases, and can you kind of clue in on is one more infectious, is one more autoimmune, demyelinating, if you can kind of tell based on the, on the pattern on MRI. And the answer should hopefully still be no. Uh, and so what you notice is one's PML, one's herpes, LGI-1, which is an autoimmune uh, encephalitis, neurosyphilis, adenovirus, a perineoplastic disorder, status, so seizures, epilepsy, and the last one's like CJD, uh, prion disease. Okay. And then I wanted to talk about just the CSF profile. So if you guys remember, you know, from your kind of your basic training is we learned CSF profile, I think in a very uh, archaic way, we learn it as the CSF profile can be classic for bacteria, fungal and viral, and then there's normal, right? So that's a kind of, whenever we do CSF, we always try to put the, the, the results into one of these boxes. And you know, sometimes you get a classic profile for one of these, and sometimes you get a mixed picture. But I think it's once again, really important to know that we have to think beyond just what we're taught and just beyond just infection, that there are other things that can present with an abnormal and a normal CSF. So here are just kind of the other, we'll say classic uh, profiles for other conditions like tuberculosis, autoimmune encephalitis, what a malignancy CSF profile can look like, sarcoidosis, HIV, well-controlled, what, what can that look like? A rheumatoid, disease with some neurologic symptoms, what can they look like CSF-wise? GBS, Guillain-Barre, so a peripheral neuropathy, um, and a CSF block, so essentially where you have like 
a very severe canal stenosis, blocking the CSF flow down, down, um, um, down the, um, your spine, can present with an abnormal CSF profile. So just kind of with the MRI and the CSF is where I'm trying to get at is that we rely on it a lot to kind of dictate our, our diagnosis, but at the same time, it's, it has its limitations and we really have to use our, our clinical skills and, um, and kind of know what kind of testing is available to rule in, rule out some things that we're thinking about. So we'll just jump into infectious encephalitis. Um, I, I want to spend a few slides on kind of thinking about how many types of infections there are. And we know about bacterial, viral, and fungal, but there's are other types too, like parasitic. And here I kind of just listed, just we'll say the most common ones that we have to think about in the US, depending on where you live, different ones may be more prevalent, but in the US, these are the kind of the ones that we have to, that we will we'll say we have to think about. And then when we think about, well, what testing do we as neurologists do we use to diagnose infections? in the brain. We obviously use the meningitis encephalitis panel. That's kind of like our go-to. And we think that, oh, a negative panel, we're out of the clear. There's nothing else that we need to kind of think about, which once again, is very false. Um, so these are the inbred or the other diseases that can be tested with the ME panel, okay? And as you can see, uh, we're not highlighting a lot of red here. So, but then you may ask the question, well, okay, well, how many of these other diseases that are not highlighted, how many of those have like a specific treatment? Because if you remember, a lot of the viruses don't really have a specific treatment. It's, it's a lot of supportive care. Um, well, looking at the different types, anything I highlighted in green has a specific antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal or antiparasitic medication that you should probably want to de like detect because that treatment is very specific and it could alter the course of the patient. And as you can see, there's more green than red, meaning that there are things that are not tested on the ME panel that we should have to be thinking about because it's not tested um, with just one quick, one quick test. Okay. A little briefly about autoimmune encephalitis. So kind of same concepts I want to go over. You know, we order panels and we love panels because it's it makes our life simple. So here I have all we'll say the most common up-to-date um, autoantibodies that we can test for, but they're not all on the same panel. You can't order one panel and it includes all of this. So you still have to use your clinical skills to figure out, well, which type of panel do I want? Um, and Mayo website does a really good job of trying to show you what different panels that they have that you can order to kind of um, get the most yield out of, out of your test. So highlighted in purple are the auto antibodies that can have a cerebellar presentation. In green, you see ones we can have a hyperkinetic, so a lot of movement, fidgety, dyskinesia, they're just moving a lot. Sleep disorders can uh, be very prevalent as well. Ones highlighted in blue have a prominent sleep disorder. And highlighted in various colors are ones that where you have a history of a malignancy. And I think that it's very important that I talk about that not all autoantibodies will present with encephalitis. I think that's re really important, okay? So not all autoantibodies will be present with encephalitis. And also not all encephalitis will ha have a known antibody. All these conditions right here, these all are conditions that we don't really have an antibody for that we diagnose in other ways, okay? But they all can look like an, an a patient with encephalitis. So now we'll go into cases. And I think what I've been faculty here for a year now. And so I am I actually am able to highlight like four cases that I've been a part of on in some way. Um, and I think it's a good way to kind of highlight 
real world cases and kind of my thought process through them. So the first case, a 23 year old female presents with headaches, neck stiffness, nausea, vomiting, confusion. Real no relevant history. She's otherwise healthy, doesn't travel anywhere, no unusual animal exposures. On the examination, a febrile, normal vitals. She's alert, but a little bit disoriented. Um, and otherwise the exam is non-focal. So this was like at, at, like at the time of ER visit, right? You know, there was enough suspicion that she wasn't her normal self. So we got the initial workup of a CAT scan. The MRI brain was negative. So that was like, you know, a false reassurance, we'll say. The EG was negative. We got some basic blood work and a new high white count on the blood work. Uh, otherwise, everything normal. So, I mean, you know, she definitely warranted admission. She had a white, high white blood cell count. You know, she maybe there's an infection brewing somewhere. So I think it's important that we kind of do further testing but she got spinal fluid, abnormal, um, cells in the 50s, lymphocytic predominance, the basic infectious workup in the CSF was negative. So then the question was like, well, what else could be going on, right? What else can be causing this in this 23 year old otherwise healthy female? Well. This isn't like the most immediate test that comes back, but uh, with the serum and the CSF uh, autoantibody panels, her NMDA did come back positive, markedly positive actually, um, for NMDA encephalitis. So a little bit about NMDA encephalitis, because this is the one that you'll hear the most when you think about autoimmune encephalitis. Um, it's a very hot topic, we'll say, like people like to People, people want to think about it and people want to diagnose it. And for some reason, patients in the ER really think of, that they have this and it leads to a lot of issues when you as the provider don't think that, that they have it. Um, so what would somebody with encephalitis, what would they look like, right? That's what I have to kind of go off of. Um, so essentially they start off with about a week of we'll say like viral prodrome. They having a URI symptoms, coughing up, GI symptoms, some diarrhea, nonspecific. It usually kind of resolves, malaise. Then in the subsequent weeks, they start having some psychosis. Psychosis can be subtle as disorganized speech, disoriented, confused, not able to work. You know, not like like forgetting what to what they're doing at work. Even maybe even more progressive symptoms psychosis, hearing things, seeing things that nobody else hears or sees, more agitated, a little bit more violent, um, not sleeping, okay? And then it progresses, maybe even seizures at this time, where, uh, which obviously will definitely present, have them present in the ER. And then if severe enough, they go into, from weeks to months, they go into this comatose state. So they are, um, uh, essentially comatose, like, you know, not interacting with their environment. They, they may have dyskinesias at this point in time, a lot of um, abnormal movements, posturing, um, they're usually intubated by this point in time because they can't protect their airway. And then over time, on the orders of months to years, they get a lot, they get better, we'll say. They get better and they, uh, can return, I don't want to say uh, back to their baseline as this chart shows, but we'll say they, they go back closer to their baseline than when they were admitted initially. So what does a workup for a patient with NMD look like? They have a, they have a normal serum, normal CSF profile, um, sometimes they have unique oligoclonal bands. Um, their MRI, 70% of the time, they're normal. Their EEGs are typically abnormal, though, and there is a classic pattern called delta brush, which can be seen on EEG that sometimes QQ you in early on before these panels come back that they may have NMD encephalitis. So our patient that we have um, on service that I just 
and the PAs, some of the PAs have been uh, have been very familiar with. I mean, has have has been there for 15, 16 months now. And uh, I mean, within the last few, she went from comatose for about six, we'll say six to eight months of just being comatose, having a few trips back and forth between the ICU and, and the step down unit to being now being alert, uh, tracking, communicating uh, whenever she has like the palsy meal valve on um, and uh, a lot better than what she was even like three months ago. And so with NMD encephalitis, you know, it's a lot of counseling with patients and even other providers who think that like this is like a death sentence that you have to kind of just call it quits whenever they're in this comatose state uh, that they actually can get a lot better, but it's a lot of supportive care. It's a lot of reassurance that, hey, we're not always going to have this smooth ride up after you start treatment or after you get the diagnosis. Um, so, you know, even with this one patient that we do have, you know, we did all the right things. She got the, her malignancy removed, which was, a, which was a teratoma, the most common one. We gave her first line medications of IVAG. She got plasma exchange. She even got steroids too, because she was at an outside hospital initially. You now she did not get better with that. We moved on to second line agents. She got rituximab and cyclophosphamide, you know, and she generally get better. And then we moved to third line agents. She got some of these. She got tocilizumab once. She got bortezomab another. These are really like chemotherapy medications that you think about with oncology that on case levels have been given to patients with NMDA. And then, you know, I went this direction because I was a little bit stuck and she wasn't getting better. Um, I hadn't really talked to other neuroimmunologists at this point in time. Um, and then I kind of escalated and did things, we'll say, you know, off, you know, off label. Um, but then eventually after talking to other neuroimmunologists, I think what I kind of came to the conclusion was is that instead of just trying all of these new agents, these third line ones that are case level, uh, if I just gave them, gave her consistent treatment that is not changing month by month, I think that's going to do her better with consistency. Um, and for me, knowing to what, knowing what to expect with complication wise, I started throwing something every month. And lo and behold, doing that for about five, six months, she really improved a lot. And so um, that's kind of my, like my learning point that I learned from from her from her case, um, she has almost all these complications. She has the seizures. She had which is well controlled now. She has dyskinesias, also well controlled now. She has this on an autonomia, well control. Behavior changes initially it was kind of hard to say because she was comatose. Now we're seeing a little bit of it of residual behavior changes right now, which we're trying to optimize. Cognitive changes, absolutely. We can tell that she's definitely not at her baseline. Um, although she actually has pretty good insight into things. She's able to tell us that she's depressed. Uh, we can, when we go into her room, we talk to her about like what TV channel she wants to watch. She's able, able to communicate what she does and does not want. So she does, definitely is cognitively there. My takeaway point for this case, um, autoimmune encephalitis, it should be a progressive symptoms of neurologic and psychiatric symptoms. So, you know, psychiatric is the most common, you know, uh, a 30 year old female with some mood behavioral issues. And then everybody wants to kind of evoke autoimmune encephalitis. And I have to kind of always push back saying that, hey, where is the neurologic symptoms? Where are your headaches? Where are your seizures? Where's your dyskinesias? I'm not seeing that. You know, I have to always push back because I don't always want to poke people with doing spinal fluid testing if I don't get that story early on. And I even counsel them sometimes as well. If you do have it, if this is early on, here are the red flag symptoms that, that if you do have, I'm more than happy to expedite your workup, but I don't want to poke your back because you're not giving me enough symptoms and risk benefit wise, I'm not right. I'm not there yet to, to want to risk doing a lumbar puncture and all the complications that you can have with the lumbar puncture. Um, if left untreated, their symptoms will progress. So I, I always tell them that, hey, 
yes, your symptoms will progress. If your symptoms are stagnant for years, this is not autoimmune encephalitis. Like you should have progression of symptoms. Like nothing's gonna happen uh, if I give you an immune suppressant medication because you've had this for years, but that's just not how the body works. So case two. So a 46 year old male presents with four years of episodic leg cramps and spasms. So four years ago, started having cramps and spasms in the legs where his legs would lock up. Essentially, he just couldn't move during these episodes and they would last, they'd be very painful, lasting for like 20 to 30 minutes at a time. And so he was, at the time he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy in his forties. And he had a baclofen pump placed because intermittently baclofen would kind of help with the muscle spasms. When you just think about like symptomatic medication, we often give baclofen first of people with just cramps and spasms. When I saw this patient, normal muscle strength when he was not having one of these episodes. But during the episodes, you see that there's a stiffness in his legs. He was in a, unable to bend the legs or extend it during these episodes. He's very, very, very tight and he was in a lot of pain. The CT head was negative. The MRI of the brain and spine was negative. EEG was negative. Nerve conduction test was negative. Serum basic blood work was negative. So I remember seeing this patient in the ER. I saw him actually twice, like once where he was he was not on my service. I was seeing as a console. And I said, I remember I said to him, I don't know why you have cerebral palsy. There's no evidence on your labs, I mean, so on your MRI. And I've never seen somebody diagnosed with late onset cerebral palsy in your forties when you were otherwise healthy, running, you know, as a child, you know, decently athletic in your twenties and thirties. Like this is, it doesn't make sense. Somebody gave you diagnosis. I don't agree with, but I, I, I wasn't really like focused on, he was admitted for other reasons. So I didn't think about too much more of a workup. And then he came back again because of the spasms. And, and I was like, uh, I mean, maybe I, I should do a little bit more of a work. I mean, so I thought about him a little bit more. Well, what else from my, like, my kind of domain could this be? Like, what else could cause stiffness and spasms in an otherwise healthy person in his 40s? And so we got some testing, and he was positive for GAD65 autoantibody. So the upper limit of, of this antibody is five, and he was a greater than 250, so, like, the highest that you could be. So what's GAD65 autoantibody? It can actually present with a few different types of presentations. Stiff persons, which is the one that he had, uh, is the most common, but you have other ones like progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus. You can have ataxia, you can have just epilepsy, and you just have just frank encephalitis, just, you know, like somebody who's just altered, confused, um, comatose. So stiff person, what do they look like? So they're stiff throughout. They have spasms, kind of what the patient's saying. They're very rigid. Usually it's axial more than appendicular, meaning that kind of more their, their torsos and the trunk is more stiff more so than their arms and legs. But it can happen either way. And they have this issue where they... Um, are afraid to walk because they'll lock up and they'll freeze and then they'll fall down. So they always mention that, hey, I'm scared to walk because I'm gonna have an episode. Um, and then they may have, and this deaf person specifically, they don't have any brainstem features. Here's a video of somebody just in an episode. Okay, look at me, how many fingers do you see? Two fingers? Yeah. How about now? Five. Very good. They're super anxious, of course. They're stiff throughout. Squeeze my finger here. Squeeze. Very good. Look, look how tight that, that patient looks. Like it's just no movement at all. He wasn't to this degree because it was only in his legs. And he had, obviously he had symptomatic, asymptomatic moments, which I saw. Okay, so, and then there's PERM, so progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus. The name kind of gives you kind of what the patient will look like. They have brainstem features, so they have a lot of like dysarthria, dysphagia, double vision. 
they're encephalopathic. They can have spinal cord involvement to where they're rigid and they have these monoclonics, so all these jerky movements of their arms and legs. They can have respiratory disturbances because when you think of brainstem issues, they can have, they can, it can lead to impaired breathing. They have autonomic issues. So here's somebody with evidence of PERM. Um, you see these little spasms and every once in a while in the arms and legs. Um, looks pretty tight as well. Just like it's very stiff kind of arms, stiff legs for sure. Because as you can see, that's not a normal um, posture of the legs. You don't, that's not a normal uh, way that you would have your legs. Um, and then so cerebellar ataxia is another one. So a little bit of discoordination. You can have other features of ataxia as well. The eye is very, actually, is a very important uh, structure when you think about like cerebellar pathways. So they can have something called opsoclonus, like jumpy eyes. Uh, here's a picture to kind of show you what jumpy eyes look like. Sometimes it's very confusing because you, when you ask a patient to look at you, you think that, that whenever you see this, that, oh, they're, they're sometimes just, ocular flutter, which is a rapid to and fro movement of the eyes can be superimposed on obsoclonus. You can see that, 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 that sometimes like you thinking that, oh, they're not actually focusing on you, that they're just moving the eyes around, but really they're, they're trying to. And these are just the monoclonic movements that, that, that you're witnessing. Similarly, pal um, palatal tremors. So basically you ask them to open their mouth. And if most people, when you open your mouth, you say, ah, you know, it just, you, you see um, the uvula, it's usually not moving, but you can have these things called palatal tremors where the uvula will move. So that, that little fixed movements, that's not the patient like saying, ah, 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 ah. It's actually, it, it, it's actually the, the actual tremor itself doing that. Um, so how do you manage this when you diagnose this? So Fortunately, it's a serum test. So it's, it's actually not too hard to test. It's not too invasive. Um, I don't really rely on spinal fluid testing. You can really just go off of the serum because it's actually more sensitive and specific in the serum. So this is also a condition that's associated, that can be associated with malignancy. Breast cancer is the most common, but in my patient, he, he had no malignancy. You can just treat with basically based on their symptoms. So just Valium, Baclofen, Tizanidine can actually help a lot with just their spasms. And then immune therapies, IVIG is the most common. And if they're refractory, you can move on to rituximab, mycophenolate, and azathioprine. Fortunately for my patient, after I made the diagnosis, we gave him IVIG in the hospital. And since then, we've been giving him, I've been giving him IVIG monthly and uh, up as a beginning of this year, he, he's been doing so well off of any type of medication that I'm trying to wean him off of the IVAG by spreading it out a little bit more to see if he can tolerate, you know, like a more like, you know, like less frequent dosing, you know. His antibodies are still markedly positive, but I don't treat, I, treat, I use the antibody for diagnosis. I don't use it for like prognosis or treatment management. So. I got the diagnosis based on the antibodies. I treat his symptoms and his clinical presentation. He's doing really good. Even though the antibodies are still elevated, I'm going to kind of wean him off because he's doing well otherwise. So takeaway point, auto antibodies can present with a non-encephalitis picture. Um, like this patient, he had no encephalitis symptoms at all, but he had a positive auto antibody. Case three, so a 65-year-old male presents with clumsiness and slurred speech. So he has a history of hepatitis B. It's well-controlled. He has fatty liver disease, no cirrhosis. He drinks one bottle of kefir daily. So it, it's like a, it's, it's a, it's like a, it's like a milk substitute, we'll say. Um, and it, on the day of admission, he drank like a bottle of, of a, a, what smelled like a rotten um, bottle, but it was, actually wasn't expired. And we asked him like, where'd you get this? He got it at like 
Whole Foods. Like he buys his kefir at Whole Foods. So it wasn't like it was like an unusual market or unusual distributor because at Whole Foods. His exam is a febrile, normal mentation, but he had double vision, slurred speech, a taxia on finger to nose, and he couldn't walk because of how profound the taxia was. We got the CAT scan negative. We got an EEG, it was negative. Um, the MRI was actually abnormal. Should have showed a lot of enhancement in the brainstem, cerebellum, and the upper, upper cervical spine, places where I would localize his symptoms to. So it worked out perfectly. This actually is his MRI. It's very subtle that you can see the enhancement. You can see where I highlighted in orange, a little bit of brightness in that brainstem area. It was very subtle at that time. So, you know, we saw this patient. We were concerned about infection. Uh, absolutely, he got a pretty invasive infectious workup, the blood work, no signs of infection anywhere. Spinal fluid, it was abnormal. The first time we did it, it was eight cells. It was like neutrophil monos. So we're like, okay, that's not normal. Um, we got another tap like a few days later because we needed to send more, more infectious tests. It was even more abnormal. Um, cells in the 50s, now it's lymphocytic predominance. Uh, and at this time, he, the patient, was still clinically stable. Like he was just still a toxic, but he was not worse at all, despite the CSF looking a lot worse. Um, you know, when I think about his story itself, we were worried about listeria, um, but nothing on these two tests showed listeria at all. And so, and I just recall like infectious disease, which we had to help with the case asking if we should treat the patient for listeria, which we initially did, but then it was weaned off after the, the initial CSF profile. And so they opted and said, no. The patient was, was very fixed on getting steroids. As you remember from my, the beginning of my talk, whenever you think about infectious causes, if that's negative, then that's when you can start, start thinking about like maybe using steroids or other things if you think about an autoimmune cause. And so even though infection was a strong concern initially, I mean, our, dif our differential would change to more autoimmune when nothing came back and we expected it too, because um, the steroid can be tested multiple ways on the blood culture, on the CSF culture, it's on the meningitis and cephalitis panel, but everything was negative. So um, yeah, so everything was negative. So, you know, we gave him the steroids because he really wanted the steroids and we gave him the risk and benefits. He was open to it. His wife was open to it. So gave him five grams of steroids. And um, on that, on the, I remember on the fifth day, we had already planned to get a brain MRI. We were like, okay, here's the fifth day. Let's see what happened after giving steroids. And on that fifth day, I remember um, um, rounding on him and he was, became, from he would, remember he was just alert, normal mentation, he went from that to stuporous, snoring, um, un, like not waking up at all. And I remember that he actually had got the MRI at that moment already, whenever I saw him. So we were able to look at the MRI. And unfortunately, the MRI was markedly abnormal. So see here, this is like a T2 with contrast. You can see here different areas of the of, of the brain now the thalamus and even some of the sinuses now enhancing lighting up he got another lumbar puncture on the same day after he went to the icu and this time with the third lumbar puncture now his me panel was positive for listeria so yeah so he was treated um, with ampicillin and he's currently on lifelong ampicillin and as of this month he was finally able to be to go to a LTAC. Um, he was, he's off the vent. Um, he was traked, so he's traked off the vent. Um, I had a follow visit with, um, with him and his wife. And um, I mean, mental status wise, he's still into me a pretty comatose state. We'll say, we'll say a vegetative state. He was basically a, eyes open, really wouldn't track you which kind of just rove around, does not follow commands. He's still mute, but he does like, he will respond to noxious stimuli when you um, uh, like provoke him. 
Um, he has his trach capped and he's breathing on its own. Um, so that's kind of where he is currently right now. Um, so listeria, so listeria, we call it listeria rhomboencephalitis. The rhombo is like an old term for kind of brain stem because that's, that's where the listeria has a predilection to um, the, the brain stem area. The epidemiology of it, you think about it with somebody who eats or consumes unpasteurized dairy, so unpasteurized milk or soft cheeses. Um, and kefir is one of the ones that you can be thinking about. Uh, um, this patient happens to drink it every day. So I think that it, it wasn't really just like the one off that he just drank a really bad kefir. I really think, think that it's just like he drank a lot of kefir and there's just like, that was really the risk factor for him. Um, if you're pregnant and if you're immunocompromised, those are other two high risk patient population. I really thought, look at this patient. And I, was, I was thinking, if it, does his hepatitis B, does his antivirals, does it do anything to his immune system to make him consider immunocompromised? But when we looked at his immune profile, it was actually very normal. So he's actually an immune competent patient who happens to have um, just, I guess, the risk factors or some sort of genetic marker that led him to having a susceptibility to getting listeria. Um, you diagnose based on initially based on the brain lesions that you see on the MRI. Blood cultures tend to be positive 61% of the time. Ours were not. And then the CSF profile can, in 20% of cases, be normal. Repeat CSF studies are needed to obtain positive cultures. And about 33% of them will be abnormal on like subsequent CSF. Once again, ours wasn't positive until when he decompensated after getting steroids. So like my theory is unfortunately that we could have probably done three, four, five other CSF studies and it probably would have been negative. He, it was just, he has such, I guess, a good immune system that it was just kept it at bay and you gave him steroids, he became immunocompromised and unleashed the, the listeria to spread even more. And at that time, that's when it was detectable by the body, unfortunately. So it was a very, very tough, case and a lot of learning points that I learned and my team learned based on this case. So my takeaway point is infectious, specifically bacterial and fungal causes, must be ruled out before starting immunosuppressants. So my last case, 34-year-old female who presents with trouble swallowing and white right-sided weakness. She has a history of AIDS. She's CD4 is very low, 23, high viral load and not adherent to antiretrovirals. She's at the beginning of her presentation, she was alert, but disoriented, dysarthric, had impaired swallowing. She was weak on her right side, um, um, basically anti-gravity, and had a lot of whole body pain and spasms throughout her body. The CAT scan and the EEG were negative, and we did get a brain MRI given that she was had AIDS and had neurologic symptoms. The MRI showed multifocal, non-enhancing white mat right matter changes kind of bilaterally. And so here are two slices of her MRIs highlighted in, uh, in the boxes are some of the T2 changes that you see. And if you would do a, a contrast study, they would not enhance. So this story itself, you know, it was very con concerning. Um, the basic blood work was unrevealing. The spinal fluid, otherwise it was pretty normal on the basic infectious workup that you get. But we knew her history of AIDS. Um, we knew that she had neurologic symptoms and her MRI, all the triad of things were concerning enough for us to be thinking about um, PML, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, um, which is a disease caused by the virus, the JC virus. And so in her CSF, the JC virus was very abnormal. It was 499 on the first tap and the upper limb of normal being less than 50 copies. So very abnormal. It, it gave us the confirmatory diagnosis of PML. So PML itself uh, can present in many ways. Um, the patient itself can look, look like somebody with meningitis, encephalitis, or focal neurosymptoms. 
even have cranial neuropathies or ataxia. And we rarely see any spinal cord or optic nerve involvement. The reason why I write that is sometimes you can be confused and think, thinking that these lesions could be like an MS lesion, but you know, MS lesions can have like optic nerve involvement and spinal cord involvement, while PML doesn't really have that. Thinking about what type of patients get PML. So highlighted in orange, the most common that you guys, that we all know are HIV patients, and they make up about 50% of the of people with PML. But there's other small subsets that we have to think about as well. People with, um, or who are immunosuppressed for other reasons. So they have transplant, they have rheumatologic disease, um, and primary immunodeficiency or sarcoid, they, 10 of, 10, they make up 10% of the of people with, H, um, with PML. And having a hematologic malignancy as well puts you at risk of having PML as well. So here I just highlight just like what a, an MRI would look like with somebody with PML, looking at the different types of sequences that you would get. Essentially, it's a white matter disease. So on flare, you see white matter changes as demonstrated. Um, they usually actually don't diffusion restrict. You see here, it's bright on DWI, but also bright on ADC. So it just kind of just shine through, not, not really diffusion restricting. Uh, they should not enhance. So you may have some subtle enhancement, but really, if you look at here, um, it should not be enhancing. Um, and then if you have a profound cerebellar presentation, you can have a lot of cerebellar atrophy as shown in this box right here. So PML, how do you treat it? Um, for our patient, we put her back on the antiretroviral medications. Um, and that was back in September. She had a very interesting hospital course and in that she came back again because her disease worsened uh, like a month later. And she's basically not in a almost in a comatose state essentially um, at that point in time. JC virus was even more elevated. Uh, we talked about different treatments that she could that we could offer her besides just putting her back on the antiretroviral. Some of these other ones have really limited data because it's still a rare disease, like mefloquin and these like very benign like chlorpromazine, mirtazapine, or risperidone are thought about based on kind of their mechanism of action, but really not really having any robust evidence that it actually works. And with this patient, you know, PD-1 inhibitors is very hot. Uh, kind of thing in the neuronk in the neuronk and onk world, obviously used for lots of different types of cancers, and uh, in the neuroinfectious world, and even neuroimmuno world, we think about pembrolizumab as uh, as actually an option to kind of what I say like unleash the immune system to fight you know either the cancer or in her case to fight the infection. Essentially what's going on with her is she doesn't have an immune system right now. She has AIDS, she has no CD4 count. Um, her T cells are, are low. She can't fight the infection. The infection's spreading, spreading, spreading. You need something, you want something to unleash the immune system so that she can fight off the infection. And Pembro can, can kind of do that. So we gave her a dose of Pembro. Subsequently, she has other complications and she's currently admitted right now for pneumonia. She's actually been admitted for two separate admissions for pneumonia, um, not doing that well. Um, haven't been able to give her any more Pembro infusion just because it hasn't been a safe window, but she's just constantly having infection, which you would anticipate if somebody's bed bound and unable to be like, unable to kind of protect their airway. So there's this entity that you have to think about with PML, with, which is called IRIS, so Immune Reconstitution Inflammatory Syndrome. Essentially, what happens is, as I kind of spoke about, you know, if you're immunosuppressed and you put somebody back on their antiretrovirals, their immune system will over time ramp up again. And that ramping up is a good thing overall because you want to fight the virus or whatever, whatever's going on. But at the same time, when that happens, your body can have like an adverse effect, which is called iris, 
where you can have worsening of your symptoms after starting antiretroviral, or you basically unmask like another infection somewhere else. Um, so the symptoms they present worse. So our patient, I haven't checked her for iris. Like I haven't repeated her MRI with any of these admissions that she's here for pneumonia, just because she actually, when I saw her, um, she actually isn't technically worse. She actually just is unchanged. Um, her pain actually is a lot better. And she definitely, so, so I'm not gonna repeat imaging because the treatment for iris um, is basically you treat with steroids um, to suppress the immune system. So as you can see, there's a lot of back and forth. Like you want the you want the antiretrovirals to boost up the immune system, but if it gets too you know too active, um, you want to suppress it with steroids. And so you want to find this middle ground of where the virus is is being attacked by your body, but not too much that's causing you more issues with 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 other other organ damage or other complications. So it's very, very finicky. And so I opted not to ch check her for iris because I um, don't think that she's actually neurologically worse at this time. And I don't technically wanna give her steroids right now when she's treating, being treated for uh, active pneumonia. Um, so iris is a good thing, right? So takeaway point, when you're immunosuppressed, Iris of evidence is evidence of iris is not always a bad thing. Um, you want the immune system to unleash and fight the infection, but not too much where you have life-threatening complications. So in this talk with basically all my takeaway points, um, encephalitis is a diagnosis based on the combination of signs, symptoms, and tests. Stop thinking about CSI profiles in terms of only bacterial, virus, and fungal. Okay. Infectious, specifically bacterial and fungal causes, must be ruled out before starting immunosuppressants. Neurologic autoantibodies can be seen in many types of neurologic presentations beyond encephalitis, like my patient with stiff persons. Negative autoantibody does not mean autoimmune encephalitis is ruled out. There are other encephalitides that are autoimmune caused that you cannot test with autoantibodies at this time. Autoimmune encephalitis must include progressive neurologic and psych symptoms, things that sometimes we tend to forget or people think that they have when they only have one of the two. If left untreated, their symptoms progress and so they're usually not static symptoms. When you're immunosuppressed, Evidence of iris is not always a bad thing. You want the immune system to be unleashed to fight the infection. But too much is not good because you have life threatening complications. So, with that being said, uh, I mean, that's kind of concludes my talk. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, everyone, thank you so much, Dr. Hawain. Um, the Q&A is open for anyone to type in your questions. I can read them out loud, so feel free. In the meantime, um, next week, come back, same place, same time. Dr. Huang is going to be presenting rapidly progressing dementias, so we look forward to that. Um, you'll all be getting a link for the post-test questions, please. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, any questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Great talk. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank it. See you next week. <laughs> Bye.